quick on you now. Welcome everybody to the Tribal Colleges Extension Program Special Emphasis Listening Session. I'm Janice Woodard, National Program Leader in the Division of Community and Education with the Tribal Programs Team. On with me today, I have Ara Staub, who is a Program Specialist also in the Division of Community and Education. Today, we will be discussing the special emphasis program. Next slide. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and our sincere apologies again for our technical difficulties. So we can start it earlier, but we have to call my team. We know how that goes. Um, but welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a, a virtual listening session. And this is um, a little bit about what you can expect today from the listening session. This is an opportunity for all of you to provide input uh, to assist us in NIFA in development of a the request for application. The intent of this session is for input and guidance. Um, this is not a Q&A session. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, as you already noticed. Please be sure your microphone is muted. After the moderator has read the discussion topics, please raise your hand to contribute to the discussion. Uh, we will be calling your names in order uh, the, the, the hand was raised. The recording for this listening session, it will be posted on our website. Uh, we will send the links, um, if, but here it is in the, in the screen, the Tribal Extension Grant Program, uh, USDA.gov. Um, please send written comments if you don't feel comfortable um, sharing here uh, live, but um, as well, those who will listen to this recording at a later time, so they were not able to uh, be part of the listening session today, we still take your comments and your input in consideration. Uh, written comments can be sent to myself uh, and I'll compile them to Senator National Program Leader and our directors. Uh, you can put uh, uh, ara.stop at usda.gov and it will be accepted until December 22nd of this year, 2023. So some of the purpose and priorities, this is just to uh, make sure, um, refresh everyone's mind about um, travel extension, special emphasis. Um, as you know, like if the purpose and priorities for special em emphasis is to support um, pilot projects in extension and 1994 institutions. Extension projects, as you all are very familiar with them, uh, conduct programs and activities that deliver science-based knowledge and informal education, educational programs to people, enabling them to make practical decisions. Uh, emphasizing on the pilot project, they allow extension offices to be responsive to community needs through short-term projects that address youth, agriculture, economic development, or other issues important to stakeholders. Uh, support projects that incorporate social and behavioral science disciplines, traditional ecological knowledge, global engagement, and leadership skills development. For TCEP SE, the project types are single fun function extension projects. These projects conduct programs and activities that deliver science-based knowledge and informal educational programs to people, enabling them to make practical decisions. Projects will address one or more of the following key strategic actions. They can support informal education to increase food and agricultural literacy of youth and adults, Promote science-based agricultural literacy by increasing understanding and use of food and agricultural science data, information, and programs. Build science-based capability in people to engage audiences and enable informed decision-making. Next. 
develop new applications of instructional tools and curriculum structures that increase technical competency and ensure global competitiveness, offer non-formal learning programs that increase accessibility to new audiences at a rate which new ideas and technologies are tested and or developed at the community scale, and develop programs that increase public knowledge and citizen engagement, leading to actions that protect or enhance the nation's food supply, agricultural productivity, environmental quality, community vitality, and or public health and well being. The grant type is a standard grant. A standard grant supports targeted original scientific education and teaching, extension, or integrated projects. An eligible institution may submit a grant application for project activities to be undertaken principally on behalf of its own students or faculty and to be managed primarily by its own personnel. The project is executed without the requirement of sharing grant funds with other project partners. Some information on funding. In fiscal year 2022, the Tribal Colleges Extension Program was appropriated $9.5 million. Within this program, we have Tribal Colleges Exen Extension Program capacity applications and Tribal Colleges Extension Program special emphasis. The capacity applications was appropriated $9 million and 35 awards of $246,000 were made. In fiscal year 2022, TSEP SE was appropriated $500,000, 17 proposals were submitted, and five were funded. In fiscal year 2023, Tribal Colleges Extension Program was appropriated $11 million. Once again, 35 awards of $273,000 were made with the $10 million that was appropriated for capacity applications. For special emphasis, $1 million was appropriated and seven proposals were submitted with five being funded. Okay, we'll now begin the discussion portion of our listening session. Discussion topic one, please discuss the adequacy of current TSEP funding levels to support new extension pilot projects. Anyone can start, feel free to raise your hand and you will be called on. Courtney Lobster has raised her hand first. And Courtney, if you can start us with the discussion. Yeah, um, thank you. So I, I was really struck by, you know, the number of people that applied for special emphasis in 2022. And then we had five funded, and then we had seven in 2023 and five funded. And I, I know that has a little bit to do with where we were probably in the cycle, but maybe that also has to do with um, uh, people finding this a little bit hard to apply for this in this very, very competitive uh, special emphasis round. You know, it takes a lot of time and energy. And so if, you know, if they looked at 2020. I think it was 2022, and they saw that 17 people wrote proposals and only what five were funded or seven. I think you know that might be 
where it becomes very clear that it's not very adequate because people are like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, am I going to spend this much time when I have a very low chance of getting funded? So I think that may be something to look at to, to kind of answer or start thinking about that question of whether or not we have um, funding. Um, and part of this too, and I don't know if we'll get to it. So I'll, so if we do later, I'll expand on this. But the other thing is the, the two year cycle is really hard. Even I know these are pilot projects, but you know, to try to really investigate something that we may want to obtain other types of funding to keep going in just two years is is really difficult. So that might be that may, might be something else to consider. Thank you, Courtney. Anyone else? Okay, if there's no more discussion, then we'll move to discussion topic two. Topic two, please discuss the need for more resources to develop extension pilot projects. Jessica. Yeah, I think for me, the problem with, with this is I don't have the resources or staff or time for a pilot project. It is either a project that we are going to do and it's going to happen and it's going to continue or we're not doing it. We, we don't have the time to try something that may or may not work. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else have anything to say? No, done. Courtney. Courtney. Well, you know, and, and just to kind of, you know, piggyback off of that, uh, I think that gets back to the the length of time because, again, like like I believe as Jessica said, you know, you're, you're kind of going into it and you're devoting a lot of time to make this, you know, it's something that is obviously really important. And um, for us, it's a time like in between our, the four year extension to try things. But um, if you only have two years to try to make it, to try to, to figure out what's going to work and to build to build the program to the point where we can either either have it sustained by the community or in some other way or or are willing to look for other resources and have the time to work look for other resources it it does get it does get difficult to to do the to to make your special emphasis um uh a success and and to figure out how you're going to move it beyond this pilot project level so that i think that to me is is that's what i see as far as resources go is kind of time mm -hmm. i had a similar question Oh, uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Doug. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was going to be kind of what my question was, too, is that, okay, so what if I develop a project uh, and it's successful? Uh, I have no guarantee that I can sustain that uh, using this particular kind of fund. So, you know, 
if it is successful and uh, has a great contribution to the programming, and then um, if I'm not, if I, if I don't have the guarantee that I'm going to be able to utilize that resource again in the future, if that project is, uh, you know, successful, uh, then then what are my options? I believe so, as a as an extension pilot project, um, should you find I, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So I think we have it in another one or two discussion topics. So um, we'll we'll save your question and thoughts on this, um, Joe, um, for a couple more discussion topics. Okay. Thank you, Joe. And we had Dennis raise her hand earlier. Dennis, and you would want to add more? And then we have Terrence. Yeah, uh, my comment really builds on what's already been said uh, regarding the need for more resources. So I'm thinking of resources in a broad sense. So uh, funding, uh, time, and staffing. So the, the, it's the typical you know, key factors. Uh, and the, the, they're, they're all challenging. So it's not the pilot project itself. If we can address, if we have access to access to adequate resources, uh, we are eager to uh, carry out pilot projects. Hopefully, they will lead to something more operational. But uh, the you know it's I mean we do have a need for more resources. This the solution is is not a simple one. I understand that. So uh, I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Terrence? Yes, I'm here. How are you doing, Janice? I'm good. How are you? Good. See, you know, in looking at this, um, we've we've kind of been um, kind of trying to develop, you know, um, different pilot projects within the parameters of the extension capacity grant we currently have. And, um, you know, going over my annual report, we kind of visited a little bit about it. We, we started doing horsemanship programs, but it just didn't stop with that. We started adding cultural events. We started going out to the communities and instead of waiting for the people from the extended communities to come to us. You know, one of the problems we're running into now, it's um, what we started is kind of getting bigger than, than we had hoped, or actually not hoped, but had imagined. Um, and living in northeastern Montana, we have such a short season here outdoors. And um, one of the problems we're coming into, there, there's an old indoor arena on one of the communities here. And some individuals are trying to resurrect it. They're, 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 they're trying to put some work into it. But, you know, like from our point of view, we would like to use it. And um, they said we could. But, I mean the grants are so limited that, that we just can't help them get it in the shape that it needs to be to continue providing services throughout the winter. Now, I know, like I said, we'd like to, we can, you know, volunteer, do some stuff, but you know, there's things they need. Um, they need fresh soil in there. They need some work with, um, you know, debris getting hauled out of there. They need work with, um, you know, corrals, whatever. But, um, is that something that, you know, NIFA can look at down the road, um, giving us the ability to help these programs so that we can help ourselves, especially in these northern states where we have such a short, short season? Um, I guess that's my question because they've reached out to us and asked us, and I, st I told them, I said, there's really nothing we can do other than maybe rent it for an event. I said, um, hands are kind of tied. Um, do you have any input on that, Janice? Um, I think that something that you and I, um, we can most definitely um, talk about right now, um, 
the purpose of this is to really gather information about um, this, the special emphasis project. So we're really, it's not necessarily a question and answer. It's more of a discussion, but I would be more than happy um, to talk to you further about this. So Great. we'll make sure that we set up a set up a time to talk, Terrence. Great, I'd, I'd really like that. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Felix, did you, I saw a hand. Did you have a comment? Yeah, Janice, thank you very much. Um, I think with us here at BCC, just because we got uh, the MPP uh, grant for the facility to build here or to get, um, we're looking at the Buffalo program as one of the um, emphasis grant for the meat side of things. Um, can I supplement some of those with this um, MPP grant? And then to do, do, do you guys want a finished product at the end as a as a pilot project also? Or is this something that um, we want to see if it works or not? Because for, for, for us, I really want this to happen. I mean, and I know we're going to make it happen just because of the, the extension portion that we have, the new grant that we kind of looked at. Um, so this would be something that would tie into both of the programs, I think. Right. Yeah. And I think, Felix, once again, um, we can, I think we should set up a time uh, to have a discussion um, um, in the future, another time besides this. Right now, we're just um, not really doing a question and answer session. It's more of a, it's more of a discussion to just um, learn about your thoughts um, on special emphasis. So we will set up a, a meeting uh, to talk about um, what you wanna do. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Sure. Is there any other discussion on this topic? Okay, hey, then we'll move to topic three. Please discuss ways to ensure that extension pilot projects are responsive to community needs. Christopher? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, now, uh, to the group, my name is Chris Asbell. I'm the new extension agent uh, here in uh, uh, Omoni, Oklahoma for the uh, Let's Go Creek Nation. I'm a Creek citizen, and my uh, partner's on here too, Dana Deer. Just want to introduce you guys real quick. Uh, we talked about this at the onset of uh, our employment here, and one of the things that we're really going to do is uh, put out some um, questionnaires and surveys in, in the actual uh, native community uh, surrounding Omogi and the areas that we serve and that to identify those needs. And so that when we get ready to apply for uh, various grants, including this extension um, pilot project that we're creating projects that are indeed uh, meaningful and gonna be have, uh, impactful to uh, the Muskogee community. So. Um, a need kind of needs assessment. That's what we're looking at and using that survey to do that. And then to do follow up uh, interviews with uh, the different communities to make sure that this is something that's actually going to be impactful for them. Thank you. Does anyone else have any input on the topic? Okay, then let's move to topic four. Please discuss the outcome of extension pilot projects once the special emphasis award has ended.
support me. So I think, you know, I think we've been, a lot of people have kind of talked about this a little bit. I think that's where the special emphasis is a, a great opportunity, but also it is, um, this is where it gets difficult with special emphasis is that, you know, if we do build something that is successful, um, depending on where we are within our grant timelines, uh, you know, it may be something that we can't, we don't, you know, it will fall between so that we can't add it to our extension proposals. Um, and so then it gets to, <clears throat> you know, can, what can we do in order to keep, you know, the project going? And um, with some of these, it's, it's not easy to find uh, other sources to keep the special emphasis going. Um, sometimes I feel like we can um, write a proposal and kind of argue that, you know, like this is what we found out, but we would like to go, you know, have a little bit more time to, to um, address this other piece that came out of the special emphasis. Uh, and I think this is where, again, it gets a little tricky because you do have that sh short amount of time. And, and, and usually, you know, especially for tribal colleges, I can speak for myself. Um, we, you know, if we're writing something like that, if it's truly something that uh, we want to try, we don't put in, we can't afford to put in any preliminary effort to, to start these things until we know we have funding. So then, you know, it's it's at least six months of of kind of getting it on the ground running. Um, and so two years turns into a year and a half. And and so, um, you know, usually these special emphasis projects are something that we really believe in. But the outcomes sometimes aren't as strong because of of limited time to to go forward and, and to accomplish everything that we would like to accomplish within, within the time period given. Thank you, Courtney. Brian? Yeah, I agree with Courtney that the, you know, the, the timeline, the timeline is tricky, but, you know, I do think that uh, this, this is a, a a good opportunity for for us to try something that we otherwise wouldn't be trying, um, and then you know there there have been special emphasis uh, grants we've received where we've got to the end and and we've said uh, that that didn't go as well as we thought it would, um, so so you know we're not going to make it part of our our annual extension, but you know this this does give us that opportunity to try different things out, um, and you know I, I do. I do like that capability and 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 the opportunity to to have that extra money to try something we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Marjorie. Oh, you're muted, Marjorie. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. I had a phone call in the middle of everything. It was Brenda. Um, anyway, so um, I love the idea of having um, sort of a, a shorter grant that you know allows us to explore something, but I hate the idea of if it works and then, well, everybody knows how competitive the grants are. So it might be that you don't get funded to continue the program. Is there some way that that this could be restructured so that we meet certain criteria as far as yes, this is going well, these are the things we did, whatever it is, and we can stretch it for another two years or something like that. This is the purpose of the listening session to gather information and your thoughts about, about the special emphasis program. So I think that's a, you know, your comments will be noted.
anyone else wish to contribute to this topic? Okay, let's move on to topic five. Please discuss what NIFA can do to support extension pilot projects at TCUs. Jessica. I think uh, a longer period would definitely be helpful. I know, um, especially for me, when we're starting something new, it takes a while for that momentum to build up or for people to get interested in participating. And so it's taken us um, three years, give or take, just to get our 4-H program to a point where we've got regular students. Um, so it, it takes a little longer than two years for us to get anything rolling. Thank you. Anyone else? We should have mentioned in the beginning, we have eight topics. So um, we're five down with three to go. So um, is there any other discussion on what NIFA can do to support extension pilot projects at TCUs? I would have to uh, agree with that last comment that uh, if it could be extended out uh, another year or, or uh, another uh, so it helps to get the project and gain some some good stability uh, within the time frame uh, and, and this and then just continue um, find a way to continue to fund those successful projects. Thank you. Stuart. As you know, part of our issue has always been infrastructure. Um, but I can, I can foresee some way of building the, having these, two-year programs become something else, like a building block rather than a one-shot deal. And, you know, the, you know how grants, they, they run, they fall off, the project ends. They run, they fall off, the project ends. There's got to be a better way that would make it, um, the funds have more, long-term impact because the community is the one that's going to benefit and that's really what we're we're all here for but if it, they keep falling off at the end of the the projects they that's they tend to lose momentum and to me that's kind of a waste of money and resources because can't hire anybody for two two years and get anything done and we're short staffed as you know always so it's just another maybe way of looking at it thank you Stuart Marjorie um I have to very much agree with Stuart of course he is my uh co-worker here but this is the third tribal college I've worked for and I cannot tell you how many projects that were funded and they built something, whatever it is, some program, some structure, and then funding runs out and it just falls apart. And like Stuart said, it's simply a waste of money. Why are we wasting the government's money for, for things that just fall apart? We need continuation number uh, money to keep our numbers up. Thank you. 
Ara, I can't tell who was next after Marjorie. Uh, Jessica. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree a lot. Stuart made a great point that it's really difficult when you have grants that continuously fall off. So one thing that might be helpful is if NIFA had a clearer path, once this pilot project ends, here are options for how to fund it. And I know that would kind of be different depending on the project, but some kind of clear path from where you are to where you're going to be um, would really help us feel more comfortable doing pro pilot projects. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. anyone else have any discussion on the topic? Yes, I believe Joe. Has... Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have this discussion with, with uh, USDA in regards to infrastructure uh, that came up earlier and that, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity uh, for some different kinds of projects that uh, this particular grant could help to uh, move forward uh, and that uh, tribal colleges always have a need for uh, infrastructure for facilities and housing to house uh, staff and employees. Uh, and so if NIFA can find a way or knows of a way or or has some suggestions that, uh, you know, that these, and I, and I think that was brought up earlier that, uh, you know, are there some, how can we, how can uh, NEPA help us to move these projects forward after the uh, pilot project has ended? And so the infrastructure needs, uh, you know, continue to be a need? Or uh, is there a way that NEPA can address to assist in addressing those? That's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Other comments? Okay, let's move to discussion topic six. So please discuss what NIFA can do to increase participation in project director meetings. Any thoughts? Okay, Mara, you'll have to call. Yeah, Courtney. I think uh, one thing would be kind of um, project director meetings. I mean, I, I always attend the one at Falcon. Um, but otherwise, if I, if there's, you know, because we're all really busy, I, I don't know if there's a particular uh, a topic like like today, you know, kind of the feedback, if we know we're giving feedback or there's something that we know that we're going to discuss, I think, you know, people can try to, you know, put it in their schedules more. Um, but I, I guess I'm not really sure, other than the Falcon ones, what project director meetings we're talking about. Um, so that would be my only comment. I, I would participate more in other meetings <clears throat> if I if we kind of knew the, you know, kind of the overall purpose of them. Thank you. We have Jessica and then Joe. Yeah, so I, I agree with Courtney. I'm not quite sure which meetings, so maybe um I don't know, a little more information on those might be good. Um, but 
for me with any meeting, I have to do this mental math of what am I going to get out of that versus what I could be doing with that time instead. And unless I know that there's something that is going to help me in that meeting or that is important to discuss in that meeting, it becomes low priority. Um, so finding a way to, to share that value, I think would be good. Thank you. Joe. I'd have to uh, kind of agree with Jessica is and and in that uh well like the Falcon meeting for instance it's uh scheduled at a time for uh here uh where I'm at is is a really busy time for our, our ranching season and we are um, you know doing that kind of thing and it's hard to get away at that particular time. Uh so maybe if there were the, the meetings were scheduled in uh, different locations uh, with try some different scheduling uh, to, to try to, uh, you know, uh, to get the, to increase the participation. Uh, I guess, you know, and, and like Jessica said, if we kind of knew more uh, in advance of what the, the top, the, the agenda topics we're going to be about uh, that would make it easier for us to make a decision if it was uh, worthwhile for us to attend or if we have more important things to do with our position. Thank you, Joe. Miranda. I concur with Joe. Um, I think holding any meeting in a tropical climate would definitely um, spark my engagement and I will attend as needed. Well noted. Thank you, Miranda. Hawaii always travels to us. We should go to Hawaii once in a while. Are there any other thoughts on discussion topic six besides warm climates? Oh. Go ahead, Christopher. I was just going to say, we always make sure we have food at all of our meetings. I know you can't do it on Zoom, but food does help get people to attend. <laughs> so if you have a Falcon conference, maybe uh, have food there. That'd be good. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. Anyone else? Besides food or warm climate. <laughs> All right, let's move on to discussion topic seven. Hey, please discuss what NIFA can do to encourage collaboration between 1994 extension educators and 1862 extension agents. Go ahead, Joe. Have a meeting in a tropical climate. <laughs> a little bit of humor there. Yeah. yeah, Jessica. Yeah, I, I've talked about this before, but um, I've had some really difficult interactions with the 1862 in my state, um, and. I don't know how to become equal in their mind, but it generally feels like they presume that they are the better institution and therefore should have more power over things we partner on. Um, for instance, we are supposedly co-PIs with our 1862 on a SIFAR grant, and we just had to have a month long battle over totes to store things in because they handle indirect costs differently than we do. And despite having wording from NIFA about this, they still won't accept that that's something we can charge. 
it's things like that. It makes it really difficult to partner with 1862s. Um, and unfortunately, the system's kind of set up so that those institutions are given more power right now. And so I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, Dennis? Uh, did you invite me? To... Uh, you, you have, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think one way NIFA can encourage collaboration is really to be proactive in facilitating dialogue. Uh, here in New Mexico, uh, at least from my experience uh, here at SIPI, we haven't had uh, collaboration with the 1862s or any, any other uh, land-grant institution. Uh, and, and so it's new territory. So I think a neutral, you know, NIFA in particular being, uh, you know, finding ways to facilitate the conversation and, and help identify where are the mutual benefits and, and, and perception like, like was previously, or address perceptions of equality, and, you know, e equal standing uh, it, it can be really helpful. Uh, because uh, it, I anticipate it won't collaborations won't be successful. Uh, they'll be problematic uh, in unless there are clear uh, mutual benefits and a clear motivation for investment for success on both sides. And I and my perception is that's not easy to achieve. Thank you, Dennis. Courtney? Well, Dennis just just said about what I was going to say. It, it doesn't, you know, I, you know, sometimes collaboration with 1862s just don't make sense. There's no reason to collaborate with them um, there, because there, it's just like Dennis says, there's no mutual uh, benefit there. And if you have had uh, you know, as, as uh, we were talking about, it was mentioned that feeling of inequality, um, uh, the balance of power, uh, then, you know, if it really doesn't make sense, then, then that, you know, that may not make sense. I, I would like to see this question almost reframed, where it's what can NIFA do to encourage collaboration between 1994s? And some cases that makes much more sense for 1994s in a region to collaborate on things than it does with 1862s. Thank you, Courtney. Debbie. Hi, uh, excuse my ignorance, but why are we required to um, partner with 1862s? I, I guess I missed that story or that background information. Hi, Deb. The, you are for the tribal college uh, extension. You are not required for tribal college research grant program. You are required because it's in legislation, and there's nothing NIFA can do about it when something's in legislation. Thank Does you, Erin. Thank you, Erin. Sunny. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, yes, I work at Northwest Indian College and I have a colleague who did um, partner with the 1862 project or with a project. And overall, I feel like the um, partner on a personal level was great. I think she was a wonderful person, but I felt like when it came down to um, I guess the it was it or mutually beneficial for both institutions. Um, I'm not sure because sometimes I feel like the 1862, say if they're faculty members, um, a lot of times they are working towards becoming like a full professor, and so their intention on partnering is more about um, 
having a certain number of articles published or having a certain number of projects um, that have their name on there. And I also felt like at the end, and I'm just speaking just from like an observation, you know, and then maybe a little bit what my, my colleague had shared with us as a group is that she wouldn't do it. She was not interested in having another um, research project with the 1862, because when they went to um, present on their project and kind of disseminate their findings or from their research project, um, once they once they went to do the presentation, um, I think the partner had made some specific comments about um, the tribal community being like a desert, a food desert, and you know, made some other comments without first having that dialogue or having, you know, like what's a definition to you where here on the coastal tribes, I mean, they just, once the tide is out, they can go out and harvest seafood, you know, clams, everything's in, the, in abundance. And so to refer to it as like a food desert, I feel like my colleague was a little, taken back by the comment. And so I feel like there are many reasons that sometimes uh, tribal college staff may not want to partner. And I think everybody had kind of listed similar feelings, but I'm just going based off of an actual um, project that our college had participated in. And, um, I feel like if the interest was beneficial for both institutions and done in a way where it was culturally appropriate and with good intentions and everybody had input before the information was disseminated, I just feel like that it would have been, it probably would have been a, I guess, a better experience. So I think that's just kind of what I wanted to share just based on um, our institution partnering with the 1862. Thank you, Sunny. Jessica. Sorry, Sunny just brought up a really good point that I wanted to follow up on. Um, we have some excellent uh, relationships with individuals at our 1862. A person here or there who works great with us, they do great things, we can, it's very easy. It's just as a whole, the institution uh, becomes a problem. Thanks, Jessica. Any other comments on this topic? I was just gonna say one last thing is maybe having the conversation about um, the splitting of resources. And that's another hard part was um, the college you know, always feeling like you're having to, um, versus it already being separated, laid out, and then having like a schedule of when, I guess, that reimbursement process was going to take place. Um, it was just, uh, there was like, like little hiccups and challenges along the road. I felt that really maybe added to the challenges and maybe the perception of it not being a good experience. And so I think maybe if that's something NIFA, I mean, if we were to partner in future or had those opportunities, if NIFA could help, I guess, facilitate um, just maybe some guiding principles or even, you know, these are some steps to kind of help make those partnerships um, more seamless in the transition is like, I mean, the, considering both partners when putting together something like that. Thanks, Sunny. Terrence. Sure. Um, you know, kind of what Sunny was saying, we've had some success with Montana State University Bozeman in the past, but along the lines what she was saying, it was equally beneficial for both colleges at the time. And um, the working relationship was really good. Um, it involved students from our college and students from their college. So if we're going to, you know, look at these in the future, I think we need to sit down with them beforehand before we even put in a grant together, you know, 
Is this something you guys feel good about? We feel good about it. Um, when you get that type of dialogue going into it before you even, you know, just say, hey, we want to do this. Can you guys partner? Um, I, I, I think it'll go a lot further. Um, we've had other projects with them. Um, wasn't always as, you know, equally benefit to both sides, but nevertheless, because we had a working history already established, it still went pretty well, but um, like I I agree one hundred percent with Sunny. It's got, it's it's got to be good for both institutions for it to work well. You're muted, Janice. Oh. Tom, do you have a comment? Are we just are we just supposed to talk? Sure. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we have had research projects and, and good relationships with the colleges, um, especially SDSU, School of Mines. Um, when we were writing the new extension grant, um, Leslie Henry was retiring. So I tried to call everybody in the extension programs from the universities and the state, I think SDSU, and maybe I just, but they're basically they're non-existent on our reservation. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but nobody could tell me who was doing what. And I got a hold of people in Rapid and I got a hold of people in, and, and the either positions weren't filled. And I know it was during COVID, so I, I'm not blaming anybody. But one of the things that would help would be for us somehow for, Knife or NIFA, I always say NIFA, but you say NIFA, so it doesn't matter, but tomato, potato, but um, to give us, so does NIFA fund the state extension agents or is it a different part of USDA? Fund the federally recognized tribal extension program. Which they fund cooperative extension through capacity grant funding. That, okay. so, so it's your can... office your yeah. office okay well i think what would help me anyway and uh is for us to get a list of who who's running things because i had to track people down and we'd love to work with them and we did long ago leslie had good relationships and so we're building them up again but no kidding i spent a couple of days trying to find who was who and it was kind of a you know, Pikachu thing or whatever they call it. I mean, it was, so if you could just send us lists of, hey, here's who's working and here's who's doing what. And and like I said, they may be doing a lot, but I sure couldn't find it. I couldn't find who was doing what and where they were. Yeah. So that we would can, help us. Yeah, we can, we can look into that and, and get that, get that out to you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And I think in terms of hiring people, um, the extension and the equity, they're four or five year grants, but they've been going for 30 years. So we have, you know, I mean, but so I know, I know the thing of hiring people for short term is, is, is a hard thing, but, but those, the, those grants are five years. So, you know, it makes it a little easier anyway. That's thank you, Tom. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's move to our last discussion topic. Do you have any discussion um, or input about any of the information? that should be included in the RFA, Request for Applications. Tom. I'm sorry, no, I'm here. <laughs> um, I spend, I'm the grants facilitator. I don't run the programs, but I'm supposed to make sure reports get in. And and Aaron and you have been great in in answering emails, but, in the RFA, and I know it changes, but, and I know you don't run report, and I deal with 
for all the grants we have at the college, I do with 20 different agencies, and there are some really terrible online systems. Grant solutions, if anybody ever dealt with them, they are terrible. But um, so I know you don't run that, but just kind of a listing of when reports are due. I mean, I spend a lot of time, and maybe it's me, I'm getting old, but um, trying to find out when reports are due. Um, and I know you always help when you can. And then Dana had a problem submitting our report. Last, and I don't know if that got solved yet. I have to ask her. But um, and and I think Erin said that she was having trouble with it, too. So and that would really help to say, OK, here's when the, the annual reports do the semi annual, the continuation um, and the reports. And I, I, I kind of have it in my mind, but they change sometimes. But um, I know there's a report due on February 1st and this and that, but it, sometimes it seems like they change and you, we think we know when they're doing, they're not. So anyway, if we put, if it, if you have it and you know it, put it in the RFA and then that would help. So first I can put a plug in. I actually have a grant management uh, workshop coming up on Tuesday. Uh, this Tuesday at one o'clock, and it is about reporting requirements. So um, you will be getting, um, you should have received the an invite um, to that. If you haven't, um, there will another um, set of invites will go out today. Um, but that will be on Tuesday at one central, and we'll send out a, a calendar invite for that. Um, Okay. And so, and we will be discussing all of those things that you, you just mentioned. Okay. Well, I'm sure Dana probably got it. Or has it been sent out? Yes, I can add you, Tom, to the list too, as well. So you get it as well. Tom, I have a website too that has all of the cooperative people who are funded through cooperative, cooperative extension through ECOP. In a link, I can't, the chat is disabled, so I can't add it to the chat box. Okay, you have my email. Okay, I will I will send it to you. Or I have email. yours, if you can't find mine on, I'll, I'll send, send me an email because the Tom Allen I had worked for FSA, which I don't think you'd do. Oh, there's a million Tom Allens. <laughs> and anything you'd be here bad about a Tom Allen, it's the other ones. Jessica. I'm not, but I'm not Tom. saying anything oh. about you guys because you guys are great to work with. It's just, I know how this system, but okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jessica? Yeah. Um, reporting requirements would be awesome. Just a little section that says you're going to need to do annual reports and whatever. Um, but honestly, having um, like a cheat sheet of everything you need to make sure you include with the application. So what sections do you have to have in the application? What backup documents do you need? Um, that kind of thing would be really helpful because I know it's it's all in there and you can go and find it and it's getting better. Like you guys are improving them immensely, um, but you still have to hunt for it, which is kind of a pain. Thank you. Anyone else have any? Thoughts about information to be included in the RFA? Sunny. Um, not necessarily included into the RFA, but I remember um, a while back where they used to have like, um, how would you say, like a small webinar before. Mm -hmm. The applications were actually going to are due, and they would provide us just some quick updates in regards to whether there's page different num or if there's like the number of pages has decreased or kind of the format of the grant. Like if there was any changes at all, because I feel like with um, the special emphasis grant specifically, I feel like they kind of evolved over time, and then like the number of attachments or pages and. I think we've actually, um, our grant application has had been like excluded from the pool because we had like, we had submitted attachments 
not realizing that wasn't going to be included into the overall number count of the application. So it's just like, I feel like having those, um, those, I guess, Q and R, I guess, and then just providing if there are any changes that may come up that particular funding cycle, because I know things sometimes evolve and change. Yes. Thank you, Sunny. And we do, we are actually required to offer um, those webinars ahead of uh, the um, the publishing of the RFAs. So, any other thoughts? Okay. Well, that was our um, last discussion topic. Um, Ara, if you want to move to the next slide. Okay, and so just to kind of recap, um, this will be, there is a website and, and I think maybe Ara um, can put that into the chat mm -hmm. um, where this recording, it'll take a few days, but this recording will be posted on that site. Um, and so you can go back, um, you can watch the recording, look at the discussion topics. Um, and so if you have any additional comments, um, please feel free to send us um, those comments um, via email. We'd be more than happy to take any kind of written comments. Um, what we do from here is actually go through and um, and go through the and take all of your comments and write them down, and then we'll have discussions um, with our tribal programs team, with our leadership. Um, to then look at and the special emphasis uh, program. And so here, just so you know, four of us, um, two national program leaders, myself and Aaron, um, as well as Ara and Praley. And as always, we're here to answer any questions, provide wow. any kind of technical assistance that, that you may need. So please feel free to reach out to any of us um, we do work on some, some individual projects. For example, I'm FERTEP and then Tribal Colleges Extension Program. Erin is Equity Research Grant, New Beginnings for Tribal Students. Um, generally, Ara works with me on FERTEP and Extension, and then Praley works with Erin. And Ara had just put the link into the chat um, so that you can get this recording. Next slide. And you left out two of our other programs, Next Gen and Endowment. Damn. Oh, the, those would be Aaron's Next Gen and Endowment. And of course, the obligatory non discrimination statement um, with all of the um, links and information for reaching out. And with that, I would like to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. Um, I appreciate all of your comments um, and we will most definitely be taking them into consideration. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. And I hope to see you all on Tuesday at one o'clock central to talk about reporting requirements because I'm excited to tell you all about those. Janice, okay. will, will that, um, hang on just a minute. You can stop hey, the recording. I'm on the phone. Um, yeah, so we'll